welcome. Thank you all for coming out today. It's good to see everyone. And uh, if you're visiting, thank you for coming as well. And we'd like for you to fill a visitor card out, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, it's good to see you today. And if you need communion supplies, uh, please raise your hand or just uh, we've got a box at the back that we can get communion supplies if you need it. Um, there's several traveling in our midst today, so we'd like to keep those folks in your prayers. Uh, one is Brian, the minister, and Jody will be uh, delivering the uh, sir, uh, delivering the message today. So we thank him for uh, stepping in. Uh, there's no uh, last leaders meeting this week, but there will be one next week at uh, Van and Lynn's house. Uh, Becky has asked that uh, they're going to uh, be remodeling the uh, teen girls class. And if anyone has a love seat or couch they don't need, uh, she would appreciate that. Um, Belize Mission next next Sunday. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let me find his name here. Uh, Brother William Mailer from Belize will be uh, conducting the message next Sunday, and then uh, Sunday afternoon at 4 p.m. Uh, Van and Lynn would like to invite you over if you're able to to come by and uh, spend some time spend some time with, uh, with William and there'll be dinners also also that night uh, so it's kind of a come as you come as you can and leave it leave uh, leave when you need to as well that'll be William Mailer next Sunday um, 26th of September Kimberly Scott after the uh, message will be uh, presenting uh, and, and uh, she'll have a question and answer service on Agape. So please plan to attend, uh, to stay after that one. Uh, Ladies' Day, October 9th with Sheila Butt. And then following, uh, the following day, October 10th through 13th will be Bill Haywood, who will be conducting the fall gospel meeting. Uh, one, more, uh, one more upcoming is October 30th. Uh, 4 p.m. will be the fall festival with more details to come. On the way, uh, way of prayer request, Mike Childers uh, has passed. He was uh, Oak Forest Church of Christ. Uh, he's passed with COVID. I know he's been struggling, and we've, uh, we've offered up prayers for him for many weeks. Uh, <coughs> Ted uh, Radke, Carol Anderson's brother-in-law, hospitalized after falling downstairs. Uh, Connie Singleton is having some back, back problems. Uh, Lisa Sands, Lynn... Blanton's sister recovered from COVID. Uh, Bill Bennett, I'll continue to keep him in prayers. Uh, Gary Singleton and Be uh, Billy Voss. And then uh, Florida, Florida minister, uh, Sandra Stevens asked me to uh, mention his name. Kerry uh, Berkeley is struggling with COVID. So uh, please keep him in your prayers. And I think that's all. If you will, let's go to God in prayer. Uh, one one more before we do though. There are, are several traveling this week, so uh, we're missing several folks. But keep keep those in prayers as well. All right, dear God, thank you for the day you've given us, and thank you for us. Thank you for being God today. Thank you for all you've done for us. Thank you for meeting our needs, and it just we, we're just thankful that we're able to come together today and, and worship you, and Lord. As we continue our worship service, that. Uh, we pray we do everything in a manner that's pleasing to you. Lord, be with Brother Jody as he, as he delivers a message today. Lord, we pray that uh, we're able to take that message and, and it resonates with us and we're able to apply it to our lives and that we're able to go out and share it with others. And dear God, uh, we've got several on the prayer list today and we lift prayers up. We pray for healing if it's your will and we pray for comfort for those folks and their families. Dear God, be with all the uh, servicemen uh, and women. Uh, we pray, <coughs> pray we be with uh, Afghanistan as we continue to have struggles over there. <coughs> Lord, <coughs> we pray as we continue, uh, we do everything in the pleasing of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Six seventy-seven. Six seventy-seven will be our first song. 677 <clears throat> Jesus let us come to 
Jesus is very dear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Trouble so the Savior can see. Every heartache and tear. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Calvary, Calvary. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. Jesus is very near. As Christians in this present age, it's our privilege, but also our duty, to remember Christ's death um, on a weekly basis. We do this with the Memorial Supper, the, the Lord's Supper, um, and it's our, our privilege, but our, our honor um, to do so. Will you pray with me now for the bread? Blessed dear Heavenly Father, Eternal God, we thank you so much for this day you've given us. Dear God, we thank you for this first day of the week that we have opportunity to come together as your people in this area to, to worship you. Dear God, we thank you most of all for Jesus. We thank you for his sacrifice. We thank you for his willingness to die on the cross at Calvary on our behalf. Dear God, as we partake of this unleavened bread now, which represents his body, we pray that we may do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let's have another prayer for the cup. Our God and Father, we thank you so much for this cup, this fruit of the vine that represents Jesus' precious blood that he spilt on the cross at Calvary. Dear God, we know this blood um, spilt from his body through, through his pores in the garden. It, it left his body through the his head with the crown of thorns, the nails in his hands and his feet, and his side when his side was pierced with the spear. Dear God, we know that it's access to this blood through baptism that gives us hope of eternal life. Dear God, as we partake of this cup now that represents this blood, we pray that we may do so in a manner pleasing to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, we find this time convenient to offer another prayer, thanking God for our many blessings. Um, we've got an offering box um, as you exit the auditorium on your left. Um, if you would like to contribute, um, that's, that's the place we can do that. Will you pray with me again? All wise and eternal God, we 
Thank you so much for all of the many blessings that you give us in this life. Each of us here and each of us listening today are blessed far beyond our wants and our needs. Dear God, we know that all good and precious gift comes from you. We pray that we will never forget that you provide all of these things to us and we are your stewards of everything that you have given us. Dear God, we thank you for our material blessings. We thank you for all of our spiritual blessings that we are afforded through Christ. Dear God, as we have opportunity today to give back a portion of these material blessings, we pray pray that we may do so in a manner pleasing to you. And we pray that you will bless these funds as we use them to further your kingdom here on this earth. Dear God, we thank you again for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. I will be reading from the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it from those whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small standing before the throne and the books were opened and and another book was opened, which is the book of life and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the, the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And, and if anyone's name was not found written In the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Good morning. I'm not a preacher, if you're wondering. I do a lot of work in Belize, and most of my work in Belize deals with teaching Bible classes, uh, particularly the folks who have not ever been acquainted with the concept of Scripture. Uh, Most all of them are coming out of basically either paganism, voodooism, witchcraft, or denominational uh, influences that they've been exposed to. But today we're going to talk about a subject. Okay. See, technical difficulties here. The end. Oh, no. (laughs) It's not the end, folks. We're going to talk about the end. And I got to thinking about this as I was reviewing this this lesson about a concept that we are oftentimes so negligent to realize and think about, and yet a concept which God continually, in hundreds and hundreds of ways, bring to our attention. Uh, That's the end. Vance mentioned this is the first day of the week. Well, if there's a first day, there is a last day. At midnight last night, yesterday died and today was born. And I came into today sleeping in my bed. And Lord willing, I'll leave this day sleeping in my bed. And it makes no difference about 
the birth of the day or the death of the day. What makes a difference is what I do in the day that God gave me. And so we're going to talk about the end. And what happens after the end? It's like going to a movie theater. Now, I haven't been to a movie theater in years, but when I did go, they started out with the, with the big lion roaring the start of the movie. And the actors did their thing, heroines and heroes, and at the end it says, the end. Now, what do you do at the end? Well, you go home. That's what you do. You go home. To everything, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, there is a season and a time for every purpose under the heavens. There is a time to be born, and of course, there is a time to die. 26,026. You know what that day is, that number? That's the number of days that I have been alive in this world. 26,026 today. There was a day that I was born 26,000 years ago. That was my first day. And every one of us in here have a first day. And every one of us in here have a number of days that they have lived. It'll all be different depending on who you are and what day you were actually born. But I've lived 26,026 days. Will I live to the 27th day? No one knows. I might, God willing, I will. But life's not promised to anybody. But there is a time. And for certain, no matter if I make it to the 27th day or not, there will be a day that I will get to that I will not make it through. There is a day that I was born, and there will be a day that I die, just as you and I. And then what happens? The end. You know, life's over. Now, in a movie theater, you can go back and watch it over. Do it, do it again. But in this life, you only get one go, go around. After that, you go home. The scripture that was read for us this morning says, and whose servant's name was not found written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. Whose name was not written in the book of life? So, begs the question, how does one get their name in the book of life? That's a fundamental question, one that's highly important. Well, in verse 20, chapter 20, verse 12, it says, And the books were opened. Now, in that passage read to us, we see what happens after the end. The world has been dissolved and has fled away, and all men are standing before the judgment seat of God. I saw the small and great standing before the judgment seat of God, and the books were opened. What books are opened? That's an important question. Was it the uh, Encyclopedia Botanica? Was it the writings of Darwin? Socrates? What books are opened? Paul tells Timothy in chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instructions in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. Paul writes to the Ephesians and says, How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I wrote up for in a few words, whereby when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ. Paul tells Timothy to study, to show thyself approved. Study what? The scripture. That you may 
be approved of God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And then Jesus tells us in John 12, he says, He that rejects me and receives not my words has one that judges him. The word which I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So what books are open? The Holy Scripture. The words of Jesus. The revelation from God. That is the only books that has any real value or merit. Is it good to learn mathematics? Certainly. But you know, being a rocket scientist won't make a bit of difference in this day. This day you stand before God's judgment seat, what's going to make a difference is have you studied, have you applied, and have you understood the Holy Scripture? The books were opened. The books are those of the Bible. So who is being judged by those books? The Scripture says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess, Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Who will be judged? We all will be judged before God. And what will the verdict be? What will the verdict be for you and for me and for all the other billions of people that will stand before the judgment seat of God? A young ruler comes to Jesus and says, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, Why call me good? For there is none good but God. Paul writes to the Romans and says, As it is written, There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understand. There is none that seek after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. What's the verdict going to be? When God takes you and stands you before him and says, the books are here, and he looks at your life and he looks in the book, what is the verdict? That we're found guilty. That every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. No man's going to be able to stand in that judgment seat and say, Lord, look at me. Look what a good man I was. Now, Jesus tells us of a parable of the, of the Pharisee that goes up to pray, who says, Lord, I thank thee I'm not like other men. I'm not an extortioner or a whoremonger. I tithe. I do this. That. Boy, he thought he was something. What was he? He was a sinner just like you and I, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's no one that has not committed sin. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Salvation is not earned by what you do. Salvation is a gift from God. It's by grace. But it's not just given to everybody the scripture says the grace of God has appeared unto all men but not all men are going to be saved grace is required to be obtained by faith and let's go back to the text in chapter 20 verse 12 it says but another book was opened now I want you to know that's the book I want to be in that's the one which really is what I'm hoping for. There was another book open, which is the book of life. Now, whose ever name was not found written in that book is cast into the lake of fire. That is the second death. Now, all men die. It's appointed in demand, the scripture says, once to die. But guess what? That separation of your soul from your body and your body being dead and buried doesn't stay that way. There is going to be a resurrection. And your body and your soul will be recombined together. The scripture says, fear not man that can kill the body. 
but has no effect on the soul. Fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. The second death is being cast into Gehenna. And from there, there is no return. There is no second chance. It is the ultimate conclusion of your life. You come out of the movie and you go home. But which home you go to will depend on if your name is in the book of life. So how do you get your name in the book? That seems like it'd be a pretty important question. And I have people in beliefs actually have asked me that question. Now, they don't refer to me as Mr. Reed. They refer to me as Mr. Jody. <laughs> Mr. Jody, how do I get my name in the book of life? And this passage in, in Revelation is almost always my starting point when I talk to people about their souls. Because the end is the perfect place to begin. Because the end is what you want to ultimately affect. You know, how do you get your name in the book of life? Romans says, for what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now Abraham is a key character in the New Testament. He was a, a key character in the Old Testament. Abraham is held up as the epitome, if you will, of what we are to try to imitate. We are to, to acquire the same traits. Abraham had said, believe God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man, unto whom the Lord imputes righteousness without works. Was Abraham righteous because he had no sin? No. We've already proved that all men are guilty of sin. But God imputed righteousness to him. Why? Because he believed God, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities and, and sins are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a really important thing, that God the Maker does not impute sin. Why? Because we are sinful creatures. In the flesh, we cannot but sin. I don't care how hard you try, and you should try with all your heart and strength and soul, but you're still going to stumble around and fall on your face. If that was not true, if it was possible for you to be righteous by living a sinless life, then Jesus wouldn't have needed to die at all. God could have expected you to do that. But the facts are, we are not creatures that can overcome sin totally. We've succumbed. But that doesn't mean we are willingly sinners. It means that we are struggling against sin. And God does not impute sin. And so it seems to be clear that those whose names are written in the book of life are those whose sins have been forgiven. Not that they didn't sin, but they've been forgiven by God. So the question still remains, how do you get your name in the book? Romans 6 says, But I thank God that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching or doctrine which was delivered you. He thanked God that they were the servants of sin. They were in darkness. They were walking according to their own hearts and their own desires, doing the things that the world would have you do without any thought for what's right and what's wrong. He says he thanks God that you were that type of person, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. Being then made free. There is a, a cause and effect by being obedient, you then have forgiveness. So then being free from sin, you become the servants of righteousness. You have righteousness imputed unto you. You have sin not being imputed unto you. And the scripture was fulfilled, it says in James, which said, Abraham believed God and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. 
Now, Abraham wasn't righteous in and of himself. He was righteous because of his faith and the God counting him as righteous. And the scripture says Abraham believed God. Now, that's an important concept because so many people in the world believe in God, but they don't believe God. If you go to any person who's a practicing Buddhist and say, do you believe in God? He's going to say, yeah, see, see. You ask a Hindu, you ask the Baptist, the Catholic, you ask almost any person in this entire globe, and the vast majority of people are going to say, yes, I believe in God. In fact, James says the devils believe in God. It's like what Doug was talking about, having mental consent. We have, you can have knowledge of something that doesn't actually do you a lot of good. They believe in God, but they don't believe God. And when a person tells me and believes, oh, I believe in God, I tell them, no, you do not. You are lying to yourself. Because if you believed in God, you would do what God said. It is axiomatic. For without faith, it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to the Father must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. How many times have you read that verse? Hundreds of times, I can imagine. Do you ever stop to think there's a two-point to that verse? You must believe God is, and you must believe God rewards. And what does that say? It says that you believe God. God says, if you will keep my commandments, well, do you believe God? And so back to the question. How does one get his name in the book? A man must be taught the gospel. He must hear. A man must believe what he's taught. In Romans 10, he says, Whosoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how shall they call in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? They have to hear. In Acts 2, 38, 37, it says that they were pricked in their hearts. They heard the preaching of Peter, and they were pricked in their hearts. They heard, and they believed what Peter said. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. If you have not heard it from the Word of God, it is not faith. And so people who say, I have faith, and then they practice some doctrine out there that is totally in left field. You know they don't have faith. Oh, they believe they do. I ain't saying they're not sincere in their belief. But the facts are faith only comes, true faith only comes through hearing the Word of God. Having heard, one must obey what they hear. It's not just good enough to hear it. You have to obey it. Faith of Abraham is always, 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 faith is always coupled with obedience. You cannot separate the two. No obedience, no faith. You have faith, you have obedience. Those two things, that's the reason why Jesus said, Go, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. He doesn't have to say he that is baptized not. Why? Because baptism is the act of obedience to faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Faith without obedience, James says, and James puts it as faith without works, is dead. It's worthless. It will produce absolutely no benefit whatsoever to you. One must repent. That's a change of mind that results in a change of life. Repentance is what happens when those men were pricked in their hearts, when they actually believed the teaching that Peter preached. That kind of faith doesn't say, it's not just a, an awareness, an acceptance of the truth. It is faith, and faith does what? Always brings response. Now what response does faith bring? Repentance. Men, what shall we do? They cried out. 
Why? Because they were touched in their heart and they had a desire to turn their lives around. They wanted to demonstrate to God the, the faith they actually had. John the Baptist, when he was baptizing those folks, said, bring forth fruits worthy of your repentance. If a person has repented, you will see the repentance. You can't see it in his mind, but you see it in his action. Repentance is a changing of your life. You're no longer going to walk in darkness. You're no longer going to do the things that you desire to do. You're going to devote your life and talents and strength to God. It brings about a change of life. In Acts 17, it says, The times of ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. A person who is unwilling to repent cannot and will not have their name written in the book of life. Repentance is required. Jesus said, I tell you, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repentance is not an option. And repentance is what keeps a lot of souls out of heaven. Keeps them out of the book of life. Because what does repentance require? One of the most difficult things a man ever does. Humbleness. He has to humble himself and admit, I was wrong. I need to make correction. I'm not going to make excuses like Saul did. Remember Saul? Samuel said, have you done what God... Oh, yeah, I did what God wanted. Samuel said, well, why did I hear all this mooing of the cows? Well, the people wanted to bring... Saul made every excuse under the sun other than taking responsibility for his sin. Then one must confess Jesus as Christ. Everyone that's obeyed the gospel has been asked that very important question. Do you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Romans 10.10 10 says, With the heart man believes in the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whoso therefore shall confess me before men, Jesus says, Him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. He that denies me before men, him will I deny before my Father in heaven. Acts 8, we have Philip preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, Jesus. Now in that teaching, this is what we taught. He just taught Jesus. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What does hinder me from being baptized? Baptism is a requirement as well. And what did Philip say? He said, if you believe, you may. If you believe. And he said, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Excuse me. He says, I believe that Jesus is Christ. That's the confession all of us who are children of God made. But it is not a one-time confession. We confess Jesus Christ every day we walk in this world. Every time we come in contact with some folks out there in the society that we live, we should be confessing our faith in Jesus Christ by the life that we're living, by the way that we conduct ourselves. And he says, And they both went down into the water, and Philip baptized the eunuch. Here's water. Why was it important? We don't know what, what Philip preached, but we know what Philip preached included baptism. And we know baptism is what washes away our sins. So one must have faith that leads him to obedience. And Jesus said in Matthew 6, uh, Mark 16, 15, 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. To every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be condemned. He that believeth and has coupled with his belief obedience in baptism shall be saved. Saving faith is always coupled with obedience. 
I thank God you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of teaching. Then being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. In Acts 2.44, 2, it says, and all that believed were together. Okay, All that would believe were together. Verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as were being saved. When the Lord added you to the church, he added your name to the book of life. So how does one get his name in the book of life? Simple enough. He hears the gospel. He believes that gospel that he hears. He repents. He gives his heart and soul to God. He makes the confession. You couldn't keep a, a true saint of God. Can't be stopped from saying, I believe. At every opportunity he has. That Jesus is the Christ. And he is submerged in water in baptism. And baptism becomes in contact with the blood of Jesus Christ, that which has the power to cleanse us of all our sins. And most importantly, it gets your name added to the book of life. Now that you've got your name in the book of life, what must one do to ensure that it stays there? Once you've obeyed the gospel, your name gets added to the book of life. You are saved. Because if your name's in the book, what did it say in Revelation? Whose ever name was in the book was saved. So what? There are some that teach you, once you get your name there, it's there. You're good to go. But is that really true? Does the scripture say that that's, that's, that's correct? That once you have been baptized, once you've been in the book of life, that you're going to be permanently there for the rest of time. Paul talks to the Galatians, says, You were severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen from grace. Revelation 3 says, He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus wrote your name, and Jesus can blot it out. And he says he will blot it out unless what? Unless you overcome. Be faithful unto death, and you will receive a crown of life. Can one name be blotted out of the book of life? Most assuredly it can be. So... Just as extremely important as the question, how do I get it there? It's equally important to know how to maintain it in that state. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. God expects you to, to be fruitful, to provide sacrifice, give your life to God, and conduct your life in such a way as to bring glory to God and that is your reasonable it says service be not conformed to this world you cannot be conformed you can't go along to get along you've got to stand for something or you'll fall for anything be not conformed to this world but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? You study. You apply yourself to know the scripture. That you may prove that it's good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Study to show thyself approved. A workman that needs not to be ashamed. Practice pure religion. Pure. Not hypocritical. Not polluted with with going into the world today and coming out. You know, people live all week and they come to church want to be all pious. Monday through Saturday, my word, they cuss like the sailors cuss. You know, they drink beer like the, the sailors drink. They do, sorry, <laughs> not in front against any sailors, folks. Not all sailors bet. But you understand the point. You can't be in the world and in, in Christ as well. Keep yourself unspotted. 
And it also says that you are to visit the fatherless and widows. We are to be people who demonstrate the kind of love, compassion, and concern for all men that God had for us. And besides this, it says giving all diligence. One thing I worry about as much as any, I guess, for my brethren is that they think sitting on a pew is sufficient. Studying the Bible once in a while is all right. You know, as long as I pray for my meal, I guess that's really all I need to worry about. Peter says you are to give diligence. You are to see a man who is in training, in training for the marathon. He exercises, he watches his diet, he puts forth great effort in that pursuit. He says, add to your faith. Faith is a starting point. Not the end, it's the start. It's what gets you into the book of life. He says, but add to that faith virtue, moral fortitude. And then virtue, knowledge, you get by study. Temperance, you get by just exercising self-control. Patience, patience, brotherly kindness, godliness, and love. All these, these things need to be in you. You need to give diligence to have these things. For if these things are in you, it says it will make it that you are neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if you lack these things, now Doug wanted to ask the question in his class, how could God's children raise a generation who didn't know God? Well, this is the reason. If you lack these things, if you don't apply yourself to having these traits, then what happens? You become blind. You cannot see it for all. You have forgotten. How can a Christian forget he was ever purged from his sins? What does that say? It says that we can become so complacent that we just come and sit in a pew or we wouldn't miss service for nothing. But we're not worshiping God. We're not giving our hearts. We're not doing the things God would have us do. We're just occupying space. Wherefore, my brother, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Give diligence to make sure your name remains in the book of life. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. So how do you ensure that you are not blotted out? You look into that perfect law of liberty. And you are a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. So is your name recorded in the book of life? Important question. Because if it's not in there, guess what? You're on the short end of a stick. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Have you obeyed the gospel? And is your name still in the book of life? For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back into perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of their souls. Seeing you have purified your hearts, that's what we all did when we obeyed the gospel. Seeing you have purified your hearts in obeying the truth through the Spirit, to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another. Jesus said, by this you, they will know you are my disciples if you have love one for the other with a pure heart fervently. And as we therefore have opportunity. Verse 9, the verse says, Do not be weary in well-doing. As we have opportunity, do good. Do good to all men, especially those of the household of faith. The end is coming. Are you ready? Now, those are the questions which people ought to con contemplate and think about, not just today, but tomorrow and the next day and every day of their life. They need to contemplate, am I ready? Because Jesus Christ is coming. If anyone is subject to the Lord's invitation, we'd ask you to come when we stand and sing. Eight 
Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Come for a cleansing to Calvary's tide. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. You may be seated. Let's turn it over to 625. 625. <clears throat> this this uh, song came to mind during uh, Doug's uh, Bible study this morning. S and did I say 625? 625. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All the wonderful passion and purity May His Spirit divine All my being refine Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me When your burden is heavy and to bear when your neighbors refuse all your love to share when you're feeling so blue don't know just what to do let the beauty of be seen in when somebody has been so unkind to you, some words spoken through and through, thank God he was begot, spat up. 
Number two, number one. Number one. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father. Through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. O perfect redemption, the purchase of blood, to every believer the promise of God. The vilest of sinners who truly obey that moment may enter the heavenly way. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory great things he hath done great things he hath taught us great things he hath done and great our rejoicing through jesus the son but pure and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport, when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Thank you, Jody. Good, good lesson. Uh, remember those that uh, have been mentioned that are sick or afflicted, been going to the doctor. Uh, we pray for them. Also, our, those in our number that are, are traveling uh, this weekend, pray that uh, they have, have tra safe travels back to their home. Let us uh, go to God in prayer, and we'll be adjourned. May we pray. 
Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that we've had to come worship you. Father, we thank you again for the good health that allows us to be here today. Father, we thank you for blessing each of us so richly. Father, we are thankful for the uh, beautiful sun this day, the beautiful weather. Father, we know that these blessings come to us through you. Father, we do pray for those in our number that uh, are sick or afflicted that were mentioned here this morning. Uh, pray that you'll be with them and be with their families, be with the uh, doctors that are, are working with them, and, and just pray that all will uh, look to you during this time. Father, we uh, pray for our, our folks and our number that are, are traveling. Pray, pray that you keep them safe. Father, we uh, pray for, for others in the world that uh, make life more comfortable for each of us. We pray for our military, our police, our firemen. Uh, Father, we uh, <clears throat> pray for our, our governments and uh, those that are, are leading our government. Pray, pray that they will look to you as they make decisions. Father, as we go now, we pray that we have safe travel, tra travel to our destination's home. We ask your prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.